So now we're getting to the really good stuff here of, uh, of change. Remember I said earlier that we're talking about trans, transitioning a church to become an intentional disciple-making church. And, um, and that, that's difficult because transition requires change, right? And uh, change means that you have to... Um, Change means that you have to change things that people don't want to change. <laughs> hey, are there any programs in your church that you think are kind of a sacred cow? Boy, you don't touch that program. <laughs> yeah, you know it's there. <clears throat> right? Man, you, you, try to change, you try to change that program, you're going to be run down the street by so-and-so. Because that's, that's the way we've always done that. We've done that for 15 years. And we're going to be doing it long after you're gone, preacher. You know, that kind of thing. So how do you deal with, how do you bring change to something like that when it doesn't really fit the pathway? See, the, the issue is really about alignment. We're addicted to programs. And we're tied to our traditions. We're addicted to programs and we're tied to our traditions. And the danger that these programs have, these sacred cows, if you will, is an issue of alignment. Your alignment distracts us from really being effective. Let me give you a couple of reasons why misalignment is so dangerous. Number one, misalignment uh, dilutes resources. You know, when you are put on a program that isn't effective, it isn't productive. It's just draining the money that, the little money that you have. It's draining the, not only the financial resources, but the man hour resources, time resources, all that gets drained. Number two, misalignment, misaligned programs clutters the schedule. You know, it clutters the schedule. Um, meaning that, you know, all of a sudden you, get, you got all this stuff on the calendar that you got to get done. And the important things kind of get crowded out by all the other things that don't really matter. Number three, misaligned programs are not strategic. You know, they're not part of the explore, connect, grow, multiply. They're not moving people through intentional stages of development. They're just there because we've always done them like that. And then uh, lastly, misaligned programs are often off limits to any criticism, no evaluation. We just do it. All right, and uh, you know when you get that kind of feedback that you are you're dealing with a good old sacred cow, right? Something that uh, you've always done, but probably is not effective. It was effective at one time, but has long, long lost uh, its effectiveness. I don't recommend that you unilaterally change programming right off the bat. Did you hear that? Do not go home and say. Well, that preacher said you just go up there and change it all. No, no. Not unless you want to leave the church. Then you can do that. But if you want to stay, you should not do that. However, there are some things that you can do that help you along the way in that. A healthy church is constantly evaluating its programming to ensure that it's producing disciples. So that's why we said that um, we're moving from uh, just a tradition to evaluation. And quite honestly, most churches don't evaluate enough. We just go, this is how we've always done it. It's worked fine 10 years ago. It'll work fine now. And we don't often evaluate, are we doing the most with what we have? And are we doing the things that really fit the biblical model and the pathway? So... Here's some things that you can do to help you uh, in evaluating your ministry. One is plan with the process in mind. Uh, in other words, you need to look at where are your needs in this process. Now, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to do probably the most uh, important assessment, evaluation of your church or ministry right now. I'm about to ask you to do it. Okay, But what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to plot... What are the programs that you do to church in each one of these phases? Now, I'll describe that more in just a minute. 
But uh, Dan Spader, who does uh, Sun Life, started Sun Life many years ago, he said that uh, several years ago he did a he did a I think it was his doctoral paper on churches, and he asked a hundred churches to uh, drop their programming into one of these categories, whether they're for reaching the lost, connecting with believers, uh, training up disciples, or multiplying the church. And what he said is this, 87 of 100 churches, that is 87% had all of their programming right here. All of it. This is what it would look like. It would say, uh, so tell me your programs. Well, uh, we do Sunday morning worship. Great. I love Sunday morning worship. What's the primary purpose of Sunday morning worship? Well, we get believers together. We pray. We study the Bible. We encourage each other. Oh, great. Well, that sounds like it's connecting believers. All right, great. So they would do worship. They would write that in there. What else you got? Well, we got Sunday night service. Oh, great. Fantastic. What do you do on Sunday night? Well, we gather believers together. We pray. We study the Bible. And we encourage each other. Okay, well, that sounds still like it's right here. So we say Sunday p.m. worship. All right, what else you got? We got men's breakfast. Oh, I love me some men's breakfast. What do you do at men's breakfast? Well, we get these men together. We study the Bible. We pray. And we encourage one another. Oh, okay. So they do men's breakfast. <laughs> Women's uh, prayer meeting. What do you do with prayer meeting? Well, do you notice what I'm doing here? Every single one of them was here. Now, let me ask you something. If you don't do anything to reach new people and you don't ever train anybody else to send people out, then what do you get? You get stagnant. That's exactly right. No, nothing flowing in and nothing flowing out. There are two bodies of water in Israel. One is the Sea of Galilee and the other is the Dead Sea. The sea of Galilee is teeming with life because it has the Jordan River flowing in and flowing out. And, they, and it's got life. You can jet ski on that thing. You can still catch fish. and still do it today. But if you go down to this Dead Sea, it just terminates in there. and never, never goes anywhere. And it's stagnant and lifeless. And really, most churches are either one or the other. They're a Galilee a Baptist, or they are a, they are a Dead Sea Methodist, all right? I don't know. I, not, not any Methodists in here, are there? All right. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But, but you get the point, right? You got the point? Say amen if you got the point. So the point is that this is, if that's 80, 87 out of 100, I, I'm telling you, it's probably more than that as far as percentage-wise of churches. Most churches do not have it. Most of us are stuck right here and just all about us. You know, we're just caring for the believer, not really reaching out, not really training, and not really mobilizing. And so uh, what you've got to do when you're planning, when you're evaluating your ministry, is saying, okay, we need something at each stage, okay? At least something at each stage. And then eventually you may need to maybe thin out some of this and build up some of this and build up some of that. Every church that I went to was, was just like this. And what we had to do gradually over time with those leaders in place, say, we've got we to gotta do more to reach lost people. We've got to do more. To, well, we can't do all that. We got, the schedule's too busy. All right, well, then let's thin some of this out because we, we have to do this. And over time, you begin to gain balance. So you want to plan with the process or the pathway in mind. Number two, you need to choose metrics to evaluate success. Now, I don't, I don't need to dive deep into this. But just to say, you've got to know if you're being effective in these areas. And a metric is simply a way to measure or determine if you're being successful in that event. If you're doing something to reach the lost, but nobody gets saved, right? Or nobody, well, let's say that, nobody even shares the gospel, it's probably not that effective, Right? So you need to do something that effectively will get the gospel out. Uh, if you're doing something to connect people, but people aren't getting connected, then obviously it's not working well. If you're training up people, but you don't really know how many are being trained up, then maybe it's not as effective as, as it could be. So creating some measurement or metric to help you determine is this being successful or not is really, really important. In our, in our team, I, used to, I just say this mantra over and over. 
facts are our friends. Facts are our friends. Facts are our friends. We don't need to fight the facts. But the fact is, we haven't baptized anybody in three years. That's the facts. We've got to do something about that. If we haven't discipled anybody in three years, those are the facts. What are we going to do about it? See, I'm saying we don't need to push the facts down. We just need to determine what are our measurements. Most churches measure uh, budget, <laughs> right? That's the clearest metric that we have. Uh, baptisms, usually. Uh, attendance. Those are usually the metrics that we are accustomed to. Would you agree with that? But I, I would encourage you to think beyond that. How can we uh, assess health in these different stages? And what metrics could you use to do that? I'm not going to dive any more into that. But uh, if you'd like to know more about metrics that we use, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Uh, here's another thing that you can do to evaluate. Set clear goals. Set clear goals. Uh, there should be some goals involved in your student ministry or your or, or you know baptism or reaching out or connecting with people. Some goal that you want to have to see a certain number of people discipled in your church or a certain number of groups multiplied. You know, something along those lines. It's not ungodly to set a goal for that. You know, the Apostle Paul had lots of ambitions to go take the gospel to different places. Some of them he went to, some of them he didn't. But he had an aspiration to do it. Now, of course, if God comes in and redirects that, well, then that's wonderful too. But most churches are not like motorboats moving some direction that need to be tweaked. Some of, a lot of them are just sitting there dead in the water. And they need some aspirational goal. Hey, this, we're going to do this event to reach this group of people. We're going we're to have a goal to reach 20 people in this thing. Well, that's an aspirin. That may be way more than you've ever done before, but even if you only get 10 and not 20, still you did really well. You did more than what you had before, right? And so uh, I think that there is a healthy place for goals, goals that are specific, uh, what they call time, you know, smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound goals that stretch your faith, goals that move you forward, goals that help you to reignite motivation and inspiration in your church. Here's another thing you can do. Carve out time for evaluation. I think that you should, on a regular basis, carve out time to evaluate how are we doing. Um, if, you are, um, if, it's, if you're a single pastor and you have a, an elder board or you have a deacon board or you have a, a group that's ecclesiastical, uh, has this ecclesiastical authority, then I think it would be great at least once a year to sit down and look at how are we doing? Or how are we doing in reaching people? How are we doing in connecting people? How are we doing in discipling people? How are we doing in multiplying the church? I think this is a healthy evaluation. Without any evaluation, there can be no improvement. You understand that? You can't improve what you can't measure. You can't improve what you can't say that needs work. So just constantly saying, how do we evaluate? I think that's really, really important. And uh, over the years, I've done this in lots of different ways. Uh, we've gone on kind of uh, just prayer retreats where we look at what are, what are our facts about how many are showing up? How are we doing in our giving? How are we doing in our sharing our faith? How many of our people share their faith? How many people are being discipled? Just those kind of just in those categories, and then to say, what do you think God would want us to do? And set a goal and put an effort behind it and strive for it. Uh, I think that will move you forward. We used to do that on these retreats. Now uh, we do a kind of evaluation about every 90 days, about four times a year, we do some level of evaluation of how are we doing and what do we need to change uh, to be better. But nevertheless, evaluation is super important. If you're not evaluating how you're doing, you're, chances are you're not doing very well. Or you're at least not making progress because you don't really know what your current standing is uh, or what needs to change. And then the last thing is to make changes. Uh, once you are in evaluation mode, you've evaluated your programs, 
you got some measurement of success, you go, man, this area really needs to change. And uh, you go, oh, what needs to change is that, that kids event, we've been doing that kids event since 1923. <laughs> Nobody ever comes to that kids event. We spend $5,000 on that kid event. It's terrible. Everybody knows it's terrible. But we're afraid to change it because we don't change anything around here, right? We don't change. We want to be, we're consistent, Pastor. Yeah, you're consistently not growing, all right? That's, you know what I'm saying? So when you bring about that change, the best thing to do is not to declare it from the pulpit. We're not doing that every year. Uh, best thing to do is as you're evaluating with your leaders that you have in place, remember, you, you disciple these people, then you move them into leadership, right? Y'all remember that? Now, you're going to just evaluate how are we doing in our areas of our church to fit Jesus' model. And if you go, hey, this thing really doesn't seem to work well. We've done this for the last three years, and we've seen less people attend, less people, you know, maybe the, the thing was about sharing the gospel, fewer people hearing the gospel, think things are not, it's not going well. Here's something that we could do that would even make it better. Then you are in a better position to change something because you've made a case for it, you've measured it, you've evaluated it, and not just you, but you've had a group of people helping you evaluate it. So now it's a group decision. It's not just the mean old pastor coming in and take away Aunt Betsy's, you know, knitting club. It is, it is a, it's, it's a group, a team. We have a church that evaluates our ministry to be the best we can possibly be in the context in which God has us. Right? You don't need to be like any other church. You just need to be the best church you can be where God put you. But you need to be sure that you're leading that way to be the best you can be and not afraid to change things when they need to be changed. I think if you use this evaluation method, then you, you are able to kind of signal in advance, hey, this ministry isn't doing well. We may need to take a look at that. We're going to evaluate that as we move forward. And now they know the church knows that there's a group that's constantly evaluating to make sure we're the best we can be. One of the comments I like to make is that people in churches are like people on planes. They don't like sudden moves, okay? <laughs> now, now, here's the deal. Sometimes pastors fall in two categories. They either move too quickly, right? The young pastor comes in, he kills the choir, he puts up a praise band, he blackens out all the stained glass, you know, he... You know, he creates, he kills the drama ministry or whatever. You know, what's he doing? Well, maybe those changes need to be made. Maybe they didn't, but certainly coming in and doing a wholesale thing wasn't a wise thing. That pastor isn't employed after about six months. On the other hand, you have the ex-pastor that's been there for 12 years. And we've needed to fix the bathroom, right? For 12 years, we've not had... Uh, some things effective and, and he's just been too slow to ever because he doesn't want anybody to be upset well listen you can't lead and not make somebody upset are you with me let me say it one more time you can't lead and not make somebody upset well I just don't want anybody to be mad well then you need to be in a different lot of work because somebody's going to be mad what happens is, though, you choose who you lose. The people that, that you're tiptoeing around may be the people that are holding your church back. And the people that want to move forward are going to leave and go to some other place because they want to move forward and you're not moving forward. So you're actually losing the people that can help you and you're keeping the people that are holding you back. Now, I'm just being really honest with you. I hate it when people leave my church. I hate it. I don't like it. I had one lady who was mad at me, and she left. She was all in a huff. She goes, well, you just don't even care that people leave. I said, well, you know, you're wrong. You don't know what I care about and what I don't care about. But let me tell you, since you're out bringing it up, I said, it, it grieves me deeply that somebody would leave. I want everybody to be here. I want everybody to make this song. I want everybody to be happy. But the fact of the matter is, not everybody does. They just don't. But this is what God's called us to. This is what we're going to do. This is, we have a whole team of people looking at this. We're all moving together. And I understand if you can't do that. That grieves my heart. I wish you would come and be a part of us. But if you need to go, I understand. 
until you can say that and honestly mean it with tenderness in your heart and with evaluating process in place, then you'll always be stuck where you are. You know, it, it, it will require you to change some things to move forward. But knowing what things to change, how to change them, that's all a part of evaluating and having other people speaking into the process so that you can move forward. Our church was, uh, about two years ago, was flatlined. We had had a, a pretty steady growth, not astronomical, but steady for several years. And then about two years, it completely flattened out. And I knew there was some, I knew in my gut, when I laid my head on the pillow at night, I knew what needed to change. But I didn't want to do it. And I, because I knew if I did it, it was going to be hard. People would be upset. But over the course of time, I just realized, you know, just praying it through, praying it through, that if I can't make those decisions, then I'm actually part of the problem. I'm maintaining the status quo. And Jesus never called us to status quo. I never read anything in the gospel about status quo. I hear about risk and belief and faith and moving forward and courage, not holding back. And so waiting on the Lord had given me clear direction. We made some of those changes. And was it hard? Yeah, it was hard. Somebody leave? Yeah. But since then, we've seen more people come to faith in Christ than we ever have before. We're seeing more people disciple. Church is growing again. And I think that that's what it means to lead. So every church is different. Every dynamic is different. But my point is that in order for you to transition a church to be a disciple church, it's going to require some change, right? And that only happens at the very, very end. That's why I didn't start off talking about change. I'm talking about it now at the very end, all right, through this evaluating process. Last thing to do is when you're communicating change, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase this right over here so I can draw a picture. I've got a little picture I want to draw for you. When you're communicating change, there's a way to communicate it. And the best way to communicate change is not by, uh, from the platform on Sunday morning when nobody else knows about it, Okay. That would be a bad thing to do, all right? Well, I've just decided, you know, I've heard people say, well, the pastor, he just said it in his sermon, we're going to cut that out, or we're going to stop that. And I'm like, well, who knew that, right? That's not a good thing to do. So I want you to think about this. Think about the term cascading communication, all right? This looks like a wedding cake, a really big wedding cake, all right? And think about communication flowing down this way, Okay. Communication is cascading from one level to another. Are you with me? So you might start with what I call, this is going to sound weird, but y'all, uh, TC stands for tribal chiefs. What I mean by that is every church has got some tribal chiefs in it. You know who they are, don't you? <laughs> Their faces are coming to your mind right now. They're the ones that say whether something goes or doesn't go. I mean, they just have influence. They've been there a long time. Everybody looks at them. Everybody knows them. So I always start with the tribal chiefs. I make sure that I start with them if I'm going to, and I'll say, hey, we've been evaluating this thing for a long time, and here's what we've been looking at and how it's been working, and, and uh, man, I don't know if that's a good thing. What do you think? You know, and I just, I just get them involved with it. Then once I know I've got backing from tribal chiefs, then I may go to, you know, if you have staff, then you have staff. Or if you have maybe deacons or elders uh, involved, that would be another tier of people that you're, the tribal chief may not even be an elder in your church. They just may be somebody that's been there a long time and has a whole lot of influence. And then you may trickle it down to group leaders like Sunday school class leaders uh, or, or youth leaders or people that volunteer in the kids area, whatever. And then ultimately you get to the church, right? But, but you're never hearing these people uh, are going to be your best advocate because when you make an announcement to the church, somebody's going, whoa, who came up with that idea? That was the worst thing in the world. Well, then you've got these people, oh, no, we've heard about it. Oh, no, we've, yeah, we've been talking to the pastor about that. No, we, we understand. He's been talking to us. And so they, they help the church come to acceptance of the changes that are there. 
The biggest mistake is for you to talk to this group first. Don't do that. Trust me, I've been doing this a while. Don't do that, all right? Talk to these people first. Then talk to the next group. Then talk to the next group. And then to the next group. I still do that now. We just went through a whole vision casting deal. It took us six months because I went through every single one of those groups saying it over and over and over. But by the time I get to the church, everybody knows it. It's like, oh, that's old news. Everybody knows that. And that's when you know that they bought in because you finally communicated because you said it over and over and over and over again. So communication is really critical. All right. So take a minute around your table. How do you evaluate your ministry? That's a really good question. How do you do that? If you were going to change something about how you evaluate your ministry, what would you change? What do you think needs to be different in the way you evaluate the ministry that you have now? Okay. All right. Answer that question. And uh, what changes do you think you would need to make? in your church. Right now, you kind of know, have a gut feeling, something that needs to change. What would you change? If, if it didn't cost you anything and if nobody would be mad, what would you change? Okay. Talk about that around your table and then we'll be in the last session. We're about to wrap up in just a minute. All right, quick. I want you to take a minute and I want you to look at, let's see, this is your handout. Uh, I think I got the wrong one. Uh, I want you to look at this sheet right here. Are you with me? It's on session four. I think it's the second page. Do you see that? I want you to take a minute and evaluate your church's ministries. And what I'd like for you to do is try to plot on this grid what are the programs that you do. Okay? We talk, we're talking about evaluation. So, I, like I mentioned before, you do Sunday morning worship, you do men's event, a women's event, you do a kid's thing, you do, um, you do Bible study, prayer meeting, whatever, whatever the choir rehearsal, whatever the stuff that you do, whatever fills up your calendar, I want you to try to plot it in one of these categories. Now, here's the trick. You have to identify the primary purpose for that event. So what is the primary purpose of your worship gathering on Sunday? What's the primary purpose of this men's event, women's event, uh, youth event? What, what's the primary thing? And then you have to drop it into a category. If the primary purpose is to reach the unchurch, then you would put it in explore. If the primary purpose is to connect with new believers or with other believers, put it in connect. If the primary purpose is to train them to multiply, that's important. Most Bible studies are not training to multiply. They're just a Bible study. So if this is a training tool you use to to help them multiply, put it there. And if you, you, the primary purpose of this is to multiply your church, then put it in the fourth category. Okay? You could probably use this tool in a much more robust way with your team evaluating your church. But this is a great way to start. Okay? So I want you to be honest. This is not aspirational. This is factual. This is what's actually happening, not what you would like it to happen. And go ahead and plot some of those right there. I know we don't have a lot of time. We're running out of time. But um, plot that there. And uh, this will be a good start for you in evaluating your ministry. So take a couple of minutes, do that. And then I'll move us right into the last session. We're going to wrap up here in about 20 minutes. We're, we're down to almost the 15 minute mark. And I want to just touch on this last one here. Uh, take that evaluation tool with you, of course. And I would encourage you to really work on that. Plotting your programming under each phase of the ministry. And uh, there's more in, in the Bull Moose book. I give more detail into that which might help you uh, in understanding what does it look like for a church to do every phase. So I I just refer you back to that. We couldn't squeeze everything in uh, to today. But um, so we talked about, we talked about the, uh, from church models, a Christ model, Christ is a model. We talked about decisions to disciples. We're committed. We define a disciple. We talked about from programs to process and 
What does that mean to have a process? Then we actually started plugging into how we do this. The pastor starts by moving from a spiritual activity to spiritual investment. He starts investing in a few. He then builds up a team. He no longer is doing it solo. He's got a team of people around him, moving them into leadership. Then he starts to actually evaluate his ministries and say, what needs to change of, of this programming that we're doing, what needs to be tweaked so that we're literally moving people through the stages and able to multiply. The last stage is what I call moving from addition to multiplication, moving from addition to multiplication. And that is that God wants every church to multiply, every church to multiply. You know, when you look at the power of multiplication, Jesus took his men and he trained them for three and a half years. And as a result of that training, it says that in two years, they had filled Jerusalem with their teaching. In two years. In four years, uh, or four and a half years, the churches were multiplying rapidly. In 19 years, they had, quote, turned the world upside down in 19 years. And then in 28 years, the gospel had spread throughout the known world. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Multiplication is a big deal. It's a big deal to Jesus. A church that never multiplies is not a a church that's pleasing to the Lord. You know, I I, I started reading about this and just started looking at all the times in Scripture when it talked about multiplication, and and there's a lot of it. You know, it says uh, in... uh, Matthew 7, Jesus said, every good tree bears good fruit. Every every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, worthless. This tree doesn't produce any fruit at all. And it's worthless. You know, another another one is found in Luke 13, where it talks about the parable of the fig tree, remember? And the fig tree wouldn't bear any fruit. And he said, cut it down. He said, no, please give me one more year to cultivate it. But he, all right, one more year. But if it doesn't bear fruit, cut it down. Again, in John, he says, I mean, in Mark 11, Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem and he sees a barren tree and he curses the barren tree. I'm just saying that over and over, when you do your own study on it, you'll find that anytime Jesus saw barrenness, it was always something that was negative. That, why is that? Because he wants us to bear fruit. Personally, our churches to bear fruit. He said, if you abide in me, John 15, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Can't do anything. And so there are a lot of reasons why churches don't bear fruit. You know, I've I've got a listing of those. I'm not going to go over them with you. Uh, But I think it's a good soul searching question to say, am I bearing fruit? You know, is our church bearing fruit? And if not, why not? You know, Liz and I were in Colorado uh, for on vacation this, this summer. And uh, we went to a Walmart because that's what you do when you go into town, right? You find the, the closest Walmart. That's got everything you need. And so we're going to Walmart and we saw this younger couple coming out of the Walmart and they started looking up in this tree that was actually in the parking lot. Like the tree, the parking lot had little, you know, little medians of grass and, and trees and they're looking in this tree. And I'm like, what are, they, what are they doing? And we were just so curious of what the, why they're looking up in this tree. And so we started looking up in the tree too. We we're just looking up, what are they looking at? And she goes, oh, that's what they're looking at. I said, what? She goes, this is a plum tree. And my wife pulled off a plum and go, there you go. I'm like, oh, sure enough, they were picking plums. They were examining to see if the tree had fruit. I think that that's a picture of what will happen when we stand before Jesus. I think he's going to look to see, is there any fruit? Any fruit in your life? Any fruit in your church? So what does fruit look like? Well, there are three ways that you bear fruit. Let me give them to you very quickly as we wrap up. First one is this. You bear fruit personally, through personal fruit, uh, personal multiplication. That is when you lead someone to Christ and you disciple another person, you're engaged in personal multiplication. Life on life. So pastor, when you find somebody, you pick a tool and you find somebody in your church and you disciple them and they disciple somebody, you're engaged in producing fruit or multiplying personally, right? Another way that you 
uh, multiply in your church is when groups multiply. So if you have a Sunday school class or whatever you call them or community groups, life groups, that are just all kinds of names for those kind of things, but most churches have some kind of group. When you have groups that start another group to reach new people, that's multiplication as well. That's called group multiplication. Group multiplication actually causes the church to grow numerically. But if you, the, uh, another level of multiplication is what I call church multiplication. And this is when the church multiplies to other churches. When the church produces other churches. Um, I really believe that if you have a disciple-making DNA, it will ultimately lead you to church planting. Because disciple-making is all about winning somebody, training them up, and sending them out. So how do you do that at a church level? Well, you gather some people and you send them out to plant a new church. And you help them and, and help them multiply and produce fruit. That's what happened to us in Oklahoma. We remember I told you at the beginning of the day, it was an inner city church. All the church around us were dying. Consultant said you can't do anything. As we began to make disciples and our, we began to multiply disciples and multiply groups in our church, the church began to grow again. Then all of a sudden we started planting churches. We started a Hispanic, we were in an inner city, church, inner city area with lots of diversity, ethnic diversity. So we planted an Indian church and we planted a, a Vietnamese church and a Korean church and a Hispanic church. And all these churches were actually meeting within our church building for a while. I mean, in between services, it looked like the United Nations. I mean, it was just all nations and languages and the Koreans were always cooking something in the kitchen that smelled bad because they had a lot of curry in it. But I kept going, can they not, can they lay off the curry, you know? But, but it was beautiful too, right? It was, it was, a, it was an aroma that, that began to reflect our community. Remember the consultant said, you don't look on the inside, anything like the outside? All of a sudden the inside was starting to change. Do you think some people didn't like that? Yeah. You think some people left over that? Yeah. But people came too. And we began to reach that. And then we started uh, planting other churches outside of our church. And this little church that nobody thought would ever grow began to multiply and grow. And it became... Uh, it, it grew more than it had ever grown in its church history. In that place where the consultant said it could never happen. This is the, the power of disciple-making culture and a multiplying church. Uh, when I came to Colleyville, remember I told you the church was very divided and had been rapid decline. The church has now grown back to where it was before. And now, because of our disciple-making DNA, we have an aggressive strategy to plant nine churches over the next five years and, and 20 churches overseas and 20 churches domestically over the next 20 years and that are disciple-making churches that will bear fruit. Why is that? Because we're committed to bearing fruit. Now listen, let me ask you a question as we wrap this up. We're going to do a little Q&A here right afterwards, I believe, but... Let me close with this. Let me ask you a question. How many apples am I holding in my hand? Wait a minute. I've heard all kinds of numbers. I heard one, and then I heard somebody say innumerable. Why do you say innumerable? Who said that? Why did you say that, sir? Trees that produce more apples. Yeah. So in one sense, I'm holding one apple, but in another sense, I'm holding an infinity of, an orchard of apple trees, right? All in. So what's the difference between the one and the multitude? Well, it's what I do with this. If I eat it, if I consume it, take a big old bite out of it, then uh, I've consumed it and it had some value. It was sweet. I liked it, enjoyed it. Gave me strength, but it's over. <laughs> That's true. I guess if I eat all the seeds, then it's over, right? <laughs> I wouldn't recommend you do that. However, if I meticulously cut this apple and I take the seeds out and I put them in a place where they can grow and I really nurture these seeds and then they get turn into saplings and I plant the saplings and so on, 
then I can develop trees that produce apples for generations to come. So the difference is consuming versus investing. Every one of us has that choice to make. Our life is like an apple. We can choose to consume life, live it for ourselves, for what we like, and our life will be over and will never make a difference. Or we can choose to invest our life seed upon seed, life upon life by discipling people and then creating churches that produce churches that disciple people. And then at the end of our life and and into heaven, we'll see that our life truly bore fruit. Fruit that will last. Fruit that will remain. So my, my wish for you today, we've covered a lot of territory. We've covered a lot of ground. Probably a bit overwhelming. But what I want you to understand is this. That this is what it comes down to. What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your church? Are you going to live for yourself? Are you going to live for the mission? Are you going to live for yourself or invest your life in others? Invest to multiply yourself, multiply groups, multiply churches that will produce fruit until Jesus Christ remains. What a great joy it would be to get into heaven and see that the little tiny seeds you planted turn out to be mighty, mighty trees that produced fruit for generation after generation after generation. That's what I want to give my life to. That's what I want to give my life to. I don't know about you, but that's what I'm doing. I'm going to live my life investing it because I know it will produce fruit that will remain. Father, I just uh, pray now that you would, Lord, move us in our heart to be a disciple of yours, to make disciples, and to lead our church to make disciples. Lord, I can't think of anything more important, anything more joy-giving, anything more eternally lasting than making disciples. And Lord, I pray that, that we would do the hard work of it, the, the diligence of defining a disciple and creating that pathway that matches the pathway, Jesus, you gave us, to do the hard work of investing our lives and creating a team and evaluating our ministries and multiplying our church. Lord, this is the work of ministry, but Lord, we cannot do it on our own. We are fundamentally incapable of doing it That's why you said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So, Lord, drive us to our knees. Drive us to a a deeper dependence on you and to a deep conviction that our life truly matters most when we invest it in others. Lord, I pray for every leader here that you would encourage them and build them up and give them wisdom and discernment and encourage to do what you are leading them to do as they shepherd the flock of God under their care. And we pray this in Christ's name and for your sake. Amen.